documentary Everybody puts a spotlight on intersex people. I speak to the director, Julie Cohen, and one of the film participants, Alicia roth Weigel. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. In the acronym LGBTQIA+, the I stands for intersex. That means people who were born with reproductive anatomy that combines characteristics of male and female. Researchers estimate that in the general population, 1.7% of people are intersex, roughly the same percentage that have red hair. But intersex people have largely been invisible due to cultural stigmas and secrecy. The medical establishment has a long history of causing harm to intersex people, often performing surgeries in childhood that are unnecessary and dangerous. Increasingly, intersex people are coming out of the closet. The documentary Everybody was released by Focus Features and is now streaming on Peacock. The filmmaker is Julie Cohen, known for films on gender equality such as RBG and My Name is Polly Murray. Julie profiles three intersex activists who tell truths about their lives with candor and creativity. She also brings a historical context telling the story of Dr. John Money, a sexologist whose clinical approach to gender in the 1960s was deeply influential on subsequent medical practice and later strongly criticized. One of Dr. Money's most notorious cases was that of David Reimer, who wasn't born intersex, but as an infant in 1966, Reimer had his penis mutilated in a circumcision accident. Dr. Money recommended that Reimer be raised as a girl, a decision that was psychologically detrimental. But for years, Dr. Money's views were held up as a prescription for how to treat intersex babies. Everybody unpacks all that history. The film is produced by NBC News Studios that has an archive of Reimer's case from past reportage on the TV news magazine Dateline. In our interview, Julie is joined by one of the main participants of Everybody, Alicia Roth Weigel. She was born intersex, presenting outwardly female, but possessing XY chromosomes. Her activism around intersex identity causes her to be frank in explaining that she was born with a vagina, but also with testes that doctors removed at a young age. That medical intervention was driven by bad science that's all too common. As Alicia explains in the film, I had never heard the word intersex in my life. I was told that I had a problem, that I was being fixed, and that I should never tell anyone about it. Because if I did, then I would not be able to find a husband if they knew what I was. Alicia recently published her memoir. It has a disarming sense of humor reflected in the title, Inverse Cowgirl. I started our conversation by asking Julie how she came to focus on intersex experience. Well, um, the film came about in kind of a twisty, turny way, as actually documentaries not rarely do. Um, in this case, um, I was a producer for Dateline NBC for many years before I left in 2007 to start making docs. Um, as anyone in the indie doc world knows uh, making a sustainable living is an ongoing challenge and one of the ways that I have met that challenge has been to continue to do work for NBC News um, during my time when I'm a doc filmmaker, sometimes freelancing stories, but more frequently even doing developing de uh, development work, helping them find stories they might want to pursue because uh, coming up with good nonfiction ideas I think has been one of my strong points. Um, so in 2018, uh, Dateline NBC, when they were starting off this whole new NBC News Studios venture to make docs, actually asked me to come back uh, part-time for a few months to look through the Dateline archives for stories that would make good jumping off points for documentaries. I The first thing I started looking into actually was um, a 25-year-old story that kind of appears in the middle 
of uh, the, the completed film, Everybody, an archival story about uh, a boy, not an intersex boy, but because of an injury to his penis, uh, the doctors and psychological experts came up with what seems like a pretty nuts idea um, with the benefit of hindsight of like, oh, well, instead of raising him as a boy with an, inner, with a, with an injured penis, let's raise this boy as a girl. Um, and um, so I, I was drawn to that story, which I did not work on, but remembered from the time that I had been at NBC and was thinking of, you know, expanding it into a doc. As the research for that, that film went on, uh, one of the first things I did was watching through all of the field tapes, not just what had appeared on the air, but everything that had been that had been shot for the story, including the interview with uh, with that now with that child um, who had been quite unhappy being put into the box of being a girl, which he wasn't. Um, and in describing why he had come forward to show his face and tell his story to Dateline, he explained that the reason that he came forward was because he was so distressed to learn that the misinterpretation of his case was being used to push and justify unnecessary surgeries on intersex babies and children. Um, that led me to looking into the modern day intersex rights movement. That led me to Alicia, who led me to Saifa and River. And um, the, the, the film kind of evolved from there, from being a story, an archival story, to being something that was going to be kind of a mix of, of, of both the archival and the modern intersex rights movement. Um, but truthfully, as we started filming interviews and verite with Alicia and Saifa and River, their stories, both what they'd been through already and talked about in interviews and what they were doing that we were following verite was so fantastic that that part of the story kept increasing and increasing and the archival kept getting a smaller and smaller part of the story before we started filming. Um, I reached out to Shauna Knizhnik, um, a friend of mine, because she appeared in the RBG uh, film, because she was one of the authors of the Notorious RBG, who um, I think it was like in 2019 that she came out as intersex. So before we started filming, I, I reached out to her to see if she might be interested in, in us hiring her as a consulting producer on the film, which um, I hugely appreciate because she's also a full-time and beyond working attorney, um, and she agreed. So, Alicia, um, you and Saifa and River, who are featured in the film, I take it by now you've had lots of different experiences with the media, some good, some bad. Um, so when Julie came to you and said, I'd like to have you in a film, what are the things that you process uh, in agreeing to participate in a project like this? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually was supposed to make a different film a few years prior with a really well-known journalist whose name I won't mention, um, but who I respect very greatly. And we had started working on that film project and very early into that process, it started feeling very icky and kind of exploitative. Um, unfortunately, due to the nature of the work that we're doing and needing to talk so freely about our bodies and the violations of our bodies, oftentimes interviews will take a certain turn that feels kind of yucky and uncomfortable. Um, so that's nothing new. However, in that on that particular project, it became clear to me that they were trying to force a storyline um, that I would fit into rather than simply documenting the work that I was already doing. Um, and the intersex movement has been active and, and struggling for 30 some odd years since um, the first intersex organization was founded in the United States uh, a couple years after I was born in the early 90s. 
And I wanted to make sure that we were doing justice to that. And when Julie reached out to me, I was feeling a little bit trepidatious based on that past experience. And um, Julie very quickly made me feel at ease. It felt like she wanted to give a platform to our stories rather than attempt to tell a story that she had already conceived in her mind. Um, and based on her track record of working on amazing films on gender equity, I had trust that she was going to do it in a positive way. Um, but beyond that track record, I think she immediately made us all feel very comfortable. I know all three of us share that, that sentiment and in the process, uh, I think she moved from being simply the director of the film and at some point transitioned into the territory of Auntie Julie for all three of us. <laughs> Julie, when I watch the film, there are many times where I'm feeling hyper-conscious of, of choices you're making, like to show archival medical photography that represents harm done to intersex people, or when you're asking people about their sex lives and I wonder if you can give me an example of one of those editorial decisions that you know you recognize as a challenge and how you worked through it. Yeah, um, you're right. There were a lot of those. I mean, there's always so many editorial decisions um, in making a documentary. I think in this case, um, there were many that revolved around kind of sensitivity. Um, you know, I had sort of gone into our, 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 what's odd is that the, the interviews, the close-up interviews of each of the main participants, um, I call them stars for reasons that I feel like become obvious when you see the film, but um, the, uh, the, the, those very close-up full screen interviews with each of um, the three participants really started off, those are the first interviews that we did and quite early in the filming process. And I really viewed those as an experiment. I wasn't even thinking we were necessarily gonna use that or certainly use it as a main interview because I felt like we're just sort of getting to know one another. Um, we set them up in a kind of a particular way using a uh, loft space that we got so it could just be natural light so there wouldn't be like kind of light shining on people's faces like an interrogation kind, kind of thing. Um, and, um, and also having the crew set, set, set things up but then leave to another room and having me be the person behind the camera just so that, uh, and the idea really is like, let's all try to feel comfortable and I had a note to myself, like, don't really ask people a whole lot of questions about their bodies. Just like ask them, you know, tell me your story or tell me about your childhood and then see what happens. Here's a story that Alicia told. I remember when my friends first started getting their period and they would start asking me for tampons and I would never need a tampon because I don't get my period. I don't have a uterus. I don't have ovaries. There would be nowhere for a period to come from. And yet I started carrying around tampons because I had to keep up this facade. I would have to take these pills or use like dilators. They're like these like medical produced dildos because they want to make sure that your vagina is big enough to have penetrative sex with a man. And like I couldn't even like share that experience like with my parents, like the doctors told me to do that. And I was like 11 or 12, like using these dildos, like alone in a closet in my house. As it happened, Alicia's was actually the first, like, and, and I thought it was, oh, it's just gonna be her. But then it turned out to be true for Saifa and River as well. They were so, such beautiful articulators of their own stories that I was like, whoa, we're like a third of the way done with the film already. Like their stories are amazing. Like everything these people are saying to me feels so interesting, frankly, which is what you're wanting in a documentary and moving and very open that like, I think this is really, you know, a, a, just a major basis of everything. So I guess that's 
you know, that was one, one editorial decision that is sort of in two parts, like, oh, let's not worry too much about these first interviews. They should be kind of like trust building. And then they're so good, like, no, this is the main thing. And I also felt found myself not wanting to go back and make people retread the most traumatic subject matter. So when certain, there were certain things that came up that I just decided not to pursue or include in the film because it would require a conversation that I felt like we didn't necessarily want to have. Um, and, um, the, and the medical photography, I think, is a very good question. I mean, Saifa particularly had talked quite a bit in interviews about, uh, you know, just such a negative experience of seeing intersex people portrayed as dis disembodied, dehumanized people by putting like a stamp over their, you know, put, putting a mark over their face, which was to protect someone's identity, but just creates a feeling of like criminality and negativity. Um, and, you know, towards the end of the film, we show him going to see an art exhibit in which his body is photographed and presented literally as a Greek God and as something, you know, beautiful, creating reverence. And I felt like you kind of needed to see some medical photography earlier in the film to give you the full contrast of what it was. In fact, we kept cutting the scene with the initial slides photography down as we went on because it felt like maybe a little too much. I appreciate that that is a moment that could feel somewhat triggering to intersex audiences. So, um, you know, I, I would say even including that at all wasn't like an easy choice. It was one of the things that, you know, one of the times where it felt really important to have Shauna, uh, you know, a consulting producer who is intersex to sort of think that through. Interestingly, that wasn't, you know, she saw earlier cuts in the film where she flagged certain things. That was not something that she flagged. And then when we specifically raised it, she felt like it made sense. And so that, you know, lo lots of those kind of decisions, I would say. Those early sequences that Julie referred to, um, where we're doing the one-on-one -on -one interviews, I, I call our, our Kardashian sequences. It felt kind of like doing a confessional for a reality show, but like a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> interview straight to camera that ended up becoming the center of the film. Um, I, what I have learned from the film and having uh, film crews follow me for many months is I don't think I'm meant to be a Kardashian, but doing it for this cause <laughs> felt, felt worthwhile for sure. Well, Alicia, I want to ask you about uh, the courage it takes to be open. Clearly, you've had a lot of practice uh, in giving talks about speaking openly about your body and other bodies. Um, you know, I'm thinking about a scene in the film where you're talking about some of the procedures that you were subjected to as a child that you know, in order to tell these stories, you have to be talking about your genitals in a way that most of us never have to or do our best to avoid. Um, and I wonder what you've learned about, you know, overcoming any reluctance you, you might have to, to speak frankly about those things. It's still an ongoing process. I, having done a film tour to promote everybody immediately followed by a book tour to promote my memoir, Inverse Cowgirl. I've been on the road for six months talking about my body and myself and my, my life. And I definitely at times have felt what my friend Jonathan Van Ness from Queer Eye refers to as a vulnerability hangover. And uh, so it definitely takes like periods of recovery in between. And I have found that it has changed the way that I operate in the world because I feel so exposed oftentimes through my work that then when I'm not working, I kind of want to do the opposite and like don't want to be perceived by society. Um, even later today, I'm going to a friend's birthday 
And I have texted all my friends in advance and I've been like, Hey, advance warning on a boundary. Like I don't want to be in any photographs at this birthday party. Like I have just spent the last week on stages talking about my body, signing books, having one-on-one -on -one conversations about my body. I need a moment to just be me without being uh, on display for the world. And so I think it's, it's taught me a lot about boundaries. And I think that's a, such a huge thing when it comes to the intersex movement. It's, it's a lot of it is about boundaries and how those boundaries are violated consistently of intersex people as a child through the medical care, um, that we receive or often involuntary procedures that we undergo. Um, and so through a lot of work with therapy, I have become very adept at communicating my boundaries and understanding when and in which context I am comfortable talking about those things. And then when I feel that I need and deserve to shut that off and be like, okay, now I'm not going to be on display for the world. I'm just going to be a human being like the rest of y'all. I mean, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that because the, the film in general makes me think about uh, some of the challenges that we all have communicating across different experience, whether it's experience of gender or race or religion, even people with the best intentions uh, uh, sometimes have a reluctant to have those or reluctance to have those conversations because I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to, um, you know, uh, offend you. I don't want to look stupid by, um, by saying the wrong thing. Uh, and I wonder if, you know, for both of you who have, um, had to have conversations, uh, across these, uh, uh, these divides, um, you know, what you've learned about having those, those hard conversations and, or, you know, making mistakes in those conversations. I think, uh, what I've learned, not just through the film, but all of my work as an activist. And I write about this in one of my chapters of inverse cowgirl. Um, each of my chapters is centered on one of my tattoos because a way that I've reclaimed autonomy over my own body is getting tattoos and uh, physically inking things into my skin that I find beautiful. It's a way that I'm like, I have, I'm in the driver's seat here and ha can make decisions about my body that are based on what feels good to me, not what someone has prescribed for me. And one of the chapters is called bridge because I have a tattoo of a bridge, but really it's metaphorically, I feel like my whole life I've been able to bridge different divides. Um, obviously the male female divide in terms of my intersex identity, but so many other divides. I um, grew up in and continue to operate in more liberal or progressive spaces, but have a lot of deeply conservative family members living in a state like Texas and working in politics. I'm more often than not, um, having to engage with individuals that have very little in common with me in terms of their political beliefs and ideologies. Um, and I think what's really important in those situations is establishing safety. And I think because of what I look like and the fact that I look and present way more femme in the world that I don't look super visibly non-binary. Um, it provides me a lot of privilege and a lot of safety in the way that I operate in the world more generally. And I take that into account and I often put myself into spaces that I feel like would not be as safe for other inter intersex individuals who might have additional factors of marginalization, whether based on their race or um, the way that they, they look and, and present in the world. So I feel like I inherently have more safety based on my appearance to put myself in those circumstances. 
But also, I think whenever we're trying to have those conversations and, and put ourselves in that position, establishing safety needs to be done through a real understanding of good faith and the the idea that people might actually be curious and open to changing their minds. I think so many of us have received so much dogma throughout our lives and are reluctant to ever challenge that. And even me, someone who stands very firmly in their beliefs, I have to remind myself like the one of the things I've realized in the smartest, most intelligent people I've met in life is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And so I think if we can all operate in the world with more openness and and willingness to understand other points of views and engage with people that might not be exactly aligned with us, not just shouting into echo chambers of those who follow us on social media and are already aligned with our values. Um, it really has to do with like creating safe circumstances to do so. So whether that's through podcasts who that do that specifically, that that have that as their mandate. Like we want to create a forum where people are walking into this circumstance knowing that the focus of all of this is to cross ideological divides and have those sorts of conversations. That feels different to me and safer and more um, to have more integrity than certain circumstances I've found myself in, like an interview that a clip was used in the film where I interviewed with a conservative pundit named Steven Crowder, um, who has a whole series called Change My Mind, where he makes these infl inflammatory statements and asks people to change his mind when he has shown throughout the course of the many years of doing these segments that he is not open to having his mind changed. <laughs> his mind is unchangeable. And so I think really it's like, it boils down to creating circumstances of real safety where people feel like, they're engaging with someone who really is being open and curious and, and willing to say, okay, wow, like I am thinking differently than I was before. But I think each of us can challenge ourselves to do that every day and really question what we've learned and what we believe to be true and how receiving new information might shift how we think about a given matter. Yeah, coming right from that, I would say as a filmmaker, the key to having conversations across these divides, particularly when you're the person that's in a position of privilege, which truthfully, when you're the person behind the camera, you kind of are by definition. And the key is really not so much in what you say, it's more in listening and watching and observing and showing yourself to be a person who is open, who is willing, open, and curious, and ready to listen, if you could, if you can convey that and then shut up, I think you get quite a far way. I would say on a personal note that I feel like I'm much better at doing that as a filmmaker than I am as a human being. Because uh, for filmmaking purposes, I realize like, oh, the film's going to be better if I, if I listen now. Like, oh, I'm going to just observe everything that's happening, especially like in Verite. Like if you're interviewing someone and also doing Verite, I find it so useful not to have any prepared questions. Just totally pay attention into, in the Verite and then just ask the questions that occur to you when you're really watching and listening. Um, you, so I don't know. It's a mystery, but I can do it as a filmmaker. It's just harder to do. It's harder to be that person as a person. Alicia, going back to that uh, clip of you and the right wing Stephen Crowder, you, you write about uh, this more expansively um, in your book than we see in the film about uh, you know, the pros and cons of engaging um, with someone who's uh, so polarized uh, from you ideologically. And uh, maybe it it's extra pertinent to me since we're uh, speaking a few days before Thanksgiving when uh, lots of people in this country will be uh, sitting down with family where uh, maybe they have um, ideological uh, differences and we're heading into a presidential election year where it's going to force more of these kinds of conversations. So 
I wonder, you know, what you've learned about, you know, when to engage or when not to engage with people who have are coming from a widely different perspective from of yours. Yeah, it's a very good question. I talk about it frequently. I just gave a talk to a group of hundreds of students uh, from across the country who were at a conference focused on consent, more in the context of sexual assault and autonomy. Uh, but I spoke a lot about the intersex experience as well in terms of violations of consent. And what I said to these students and what I frequently tell people before I became an activist, I started my career in, in corporate, in the tech world. And I started off in sales roles and I learned that everything is essentially selling, whether you're selling a product, whether you're selling a candidate, whether you're selling an idea, um, it all boils down to the same thing, which is what I always told myself as a salesperson is think not what Alicia would want to project, but what's in it for me from the perspective of who I'm selling something to. And when people are at a Thanksgiving table or whether they're the subject of a documentary, thinking about who your audience is and what, what your audience's experience is and how that colors their viewpoint on a specific issue can go a long way. Many people have never been exposed to the other, whatever that other may be. I think the most conservative members of society tend to come from more rural regions because they don't have this daily exposure to people completely and entirely unlike them that you might have if you're riding the subway regularly in New York City. And so coming from the understanding that maybe someone's ignorance truly is ignorance, it's not willful ignorance, but a lack of exposure to experiences besides their own, I think can be helpful, but also understanding when it is intentional ignorance. So what I have found at the Texas State Legislature, when I used to go testifying, trying to express my experience in a way that might enlighten them or change the way that they think or vote on an issue, I have had many experiences where some of these legislators will come up to me after and they'll be like, Alicia, I loved your testimony. I told my wife about it at the dinner table last night. And then they'll still vote in the opposite way of what I'm asking them to. And it is because so many of those politicians are bought and sold by who funds their campaigns. And here in the Texas state legislature, the vast majority of that political funding comes from two oil barons in West Texas who have a financial stronghold on our state legislature. And so now when I speak to them, it's more from a perspective of knowing that regardless of what their personal viewpoints are, they have been paid to vote in a certain way. And so when I walk into that room, it's now more from a standpoint of wanting to express morality to get it into the public record so that it goes into history books, what's happening and why it's wrong. And so that people might hear about it on the news and be like, wait, that's not how I believe, or I don't like how these people are voting. And so they might feel then compelled to vote for different candidates. It's less about changing the mind of that individual legislator in the moment and creating content that can be used to change the landscape of who might be voting on these issues. So that's just one example, but I think really thinking about who your audience is and what their motivations are can help you tailor and craft your message in a way that gets your desired result. And if you're at the Thanksgiving table, it you have a lot more ability because people might have love for you and a real desire to open their ears and listen to what you're saying in a way that someone who's being paid to not listen might not have that same motivation to do so. Julie, you described how this project was born out of um, 
your research in the NBC News archives and the, and, and the project is produced by NBC uh, News Studios. Um, and when I, I've been thinking about this a lot, partly from your film, I think it comes up in um, the film, The Disappearance of Cher Height, that's also uh, produced by NBC News Studios is uh, when I go back and look at that kind of news footage from the 70s, 80s, 90s, it's easier to see now a set of biases, uh, a set of limitations in, um, you know, in the structures that were, that were creating uh, that news um, at the time. And uh, I, I wonder how you look at that, you know, going back with the, with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and, and that was a world that you were a part of as a, as a Dateline NBC uh, producer. What do you see with more clarity in, in, in hindsight about, uh, uh, about that world of, of news production from that era? Yeah, and of course, a lot of the um, archival footage that we're using in the film goes back even, you know, goes back all the way to the 60s. Um, I love archival do I, lo I love archival docs and I love archival footage, both as a filmmaker and as a viewer, frankly. I love the share height doc because it's kind of fun to look at some of the oldest clips, you know, those old clips of uh, Dr. Money on the Geraldo show and like just listening to people, like, you know, watching this old, old footage and just the way that people talked to literally any woman, you know, in that era and just think like, wow, like what were they all thinking? Um, so, um, I mean, uh, honestly, the seeing the, the way that D Dateline covered the David Reimer story in the late 90s, I was pretty impressed by its sensitivity um, for, for that era um, as, uh, as presented and the kind of the level of caring that you, you felt for this, you know, really horrifying to come out, to come at it from the outside uh, story. Um, you know, there is an aesthetic difference in the way that footage looked over the over the years, and I think part of the fun in the filmmaking, the editing process, which involved also our editor Kelly Kendrick on this on this film, was is seeing how you can use that to like help amp up a feeling of kind of the context of different eras. And in this film, we're jumping around quite a bit because I didn't want the archival section when it comes in as you know, act two to feel like it was really coming in from out of the blue. So we made a choice to uh, start salting in archival footage going back to the 60s of a central character, Dr. Money, um, from the very beginning. Um, I think when it first comes in, it's quite jarring to see the contrast from happens to be Alicia uh, <laughs> doing some dating app, a quite amusing dating app scene to an extremely uptight scene from the 60s of this psychologist and sex researcher giving a presentation before an audience of sort of very <laughs> uptight looking people, I would say. Um, so I, you know, I, I think there's a, that there's a real opportunity to create a richness when you can weave in archive from different eras into, into a film. And as I say, I also enjoy seeing that kind of stuff when I see it in other people's docs. Alicia, I want to ask, you've spent a lot of time processing intersex experience, forging alliances with others. Um, but what came out of this filmmaking process that maybe you hadn't grappled with before? I think what I learned both through filming and writing my book, because those were happening simultaneously. And so it was almost like doing therapy on my entire life in a truncated sequence. And then knowing the entire world was going to see the transcripts in both visual and written form. Um, it forced me to face a lot of myself and really deal with my, my baggage. And I think in society, we have a tendency to, towards avoidance um, of things that make us uncomfortable. 
But what I have found through the whole process is that it was really tough to go through it, but I'm so much better on the other side of it. And by better, I mean more healed and more at peace with myself. And one thing that I would urge people, intersex or not, who have seen the film or that read the book, is to focus on healing. I think in activist spaces, there's a lot of trauma because to be an activist, it means you have undergone trauma and you have experienced things in the world that need to be changed because people should not deserve to go through that. And yet there are so many activists who I think avoid dealing with their own trauma by trying to fix it at the societal level. But that perpetuates trauma because hurt people hurt people. And what I hope the film and the book will do is urge people to look at whatever they've been avoiding in their own life and consider ways that they might have been shoved into a box that's not right for them or that they might have been living in a way that's inauthentic in their own lives and might try to start the journey of reckoning with that and grappling with that. Because I think the sooner that we all deal with our own shit, <laughs> the, the sooner society is going to be better. If we are all walking around as healed individuals who have faced ourselves and learned to truly love ourselves, then we're all going to be way better equipped to, to love other people. Um, so yeah, I, I hope people walk away understanding the intersex community better. And I hope that anyone who learns our stories really focuses on their, their own healing and self-love too. I want to thank Julie Cohen and Alicia Rothweigel for speaking with me. Julie's film, Everybody, streaming on Peacock. Alicia's new memoir is titled Inverse Cowgirl. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan, marketing manager Bella Racklin, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our free newsletter at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>